بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم um, Today we are going to demonstrate for you um, how to examine the cardiovascular system and uh, really um, examining the, card the cardiovascular system is uh, very similar to uh, general examination of anybody in general medicine but with some specific points and let us see we start usually by the general look at the patient and by general look I mean the position of the patient in bed if he is sitting because of dyspnea respiratory distress if he is moving in bed or rolling in bed because of pain uh, then we uh, comment on uh, patient respiratory condition if he is in respiratory distress or not if he is dyspnea or not and if the patient looks to me by naked eye that he is edematous or not, in general look, he is edematous, he has uh, facial swelling, he has uh, generalized uh, uh, edema in the body or not, uh, then we have to comment on the bed and uh, nourishment of the patient. If the patient is with normal uh, belt for his race, because some races may have a smaller stature than other races, some races may have a taller stature than other races, so we have to know the race of the patient to adjust our description to his racial differences. Uh, also, we have to comment on the patient condition. If he is connected to oxygen therapy, if he is connected to pressure monitoring like in ICU, intensive care unit, or coronary care unit, if he is connected to uh, IV lines, and how many IV lines and which type of IV lines is very important to comment on all of these. Then we have to comment on the gait of the, of the patient. If the patient, while he is entering your office or your clinic, you have to observe his gait, if he has abnormal gait or not, if he has involuntary movement or not. Then after this general description of the patient, general description of patient condition, will start some specific examination and usually we start with the hands of the patient as you know we consider the hands as uh, one of the mirrors of the inside of the patient of the patient body so hand examination and eye examination are very important you can know many features of many diseases and many medical condition by good examination of the hands and eyes we'll start by looking at the hand of the patient uh, and we look about the nature of the small muscle, if the small muscle are atrophied or normal, and if there is sign of uncommon diseases, diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and like thyrotoxicosis or not. For example, rheumatoid arthritis will give us a spindle-shaped fingers with a swelling of the, uh, the, the, the proximal metacarpophalangeal joints, and this is a feature for rheumatoid arthritis. We may have also uh, some swelling in the metacarbophalangeal joints and in the proximal uh, uh, one. And uh, uh, some other features in, in the hands like stigmata of infective endocarditis are very important. And as we know, we can detect four stigmata for infective endocarditis in the hands. This is not common in every patient with infective endocarditis, but we have to know them. For example, we'll start by finger clubbing. And finger clubbing are four grades, as you know. The first grade in which there is obliteration of the angle between the nail bed and the, the terminal pharynx. Obliteration of the angle will give you some swelling also in the terminal pharynx here, and it will be fluctuating to some extent. But after that, the second great clubbing, there will be curvature, longitudinal curvature of uh, the finger of the patient, like bulk peaking. And in the third grade, there will be a drumstick appearance, i.e. hypertrophy of the terminal pharynx around the, the nail and the nail bed. So it will be, uh, uh, looks like a drumstick. Uh, then after that, the fourth grade, it will involve the wrist joint and we call it pulmonary osteodystrophy. So there will be grade three in the fingers and with the swelling of the wrist joint, we'll consider both as grade four clubbing. 
What else from the stigmata of endocarditis? Osler nodules, we see it in the bulbs of the terminal pharynx here, and splinter hemorrhage, we can see it under the nail, it is sub uh, hemorrhage below the nail in the nail bed. And the fourth stigmata for infective endocarditis uh, uh, is Janeway lesions, which we see it on the thinner and the hypothenar eminences. Also may see some particular hemorrhage in the hands and the soles of the foot, which may indicate infective endocarditis. We can see this particular uh, uh, hemorrhage also in the arms of the patient. What else in the hands we should see? We should see the color of the hand or the complexion. If the hand is pale or not, which may indicate anemia, uh, the bowel we detect it better in the palm of the hand of the patient, and we detect also it in the nail bed of uh, the patient, nail beds of the patient. So it's very important to examine the nail bed and the bones for bowel. Then after we uh, finished from the, uh, the, the, the bowel, if there is bowel or not, and as I mentioned, bowel should be detected in the palm of the hand, in the nail bed, and in the nail bed, then we look if there is bluish discoloration, i.e. cyanosis, in the hand of the patient or not. And if the cyanosis is in the terminal phalanx, in the periphery of the hand, or involving the whole hand. If it is involving the whole hand and the, the, the palm of the hand is warm, is warm, so most likely this might, might be related to central cyanosis due to cyano, uh, congenital cyanotic heart disease or due to COPD, i.e. respiratory failure. Either congenital cyanotic heart disease or respiratory failure. But in cases of peripheral cyanosis, we'll find that the cyanosis is confined to the fingers and the hand will be cold. And the causes for, for peripheral cyanosis are many. One of them is Reynolds phenomena in connective tissue disease. Another cause is cold weather without good warming of the body. A third cause is terminal cases of heart failure due to sluggish circulation in the periphery of the patient, in the peripheral parts of the patient. So by this, we will be commenting well and good on the color of the hand, if, if the hand is bare or not, and if the hand is cyanotic or not. After we finish from the color of the hand, we try to see if there is zanzoma palmaris, i.e. deposition of cholesterol or lipid material in the hand creases. So instead of being red like in this one, it will be yellowish or grayish due to lipid deposition. We call this uh, 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 Zanzoma Balmaris. And we look also at the dorsal aspect of the wrist joint to see if there is tendon danzomatosis or tendon danzoma or not. Uh, tendon danzoma is due to lipid deposition in the tendons around the, the, the wrist joint. And also you may find it also in the dorsal aspect of the elbow joints. So presence of lipid deposition in the dorsal aspect of the joint is called tendon danzoma. Nevertheless, since we are examining the nails, we have to see if there is a, a, a coink sign or capillary pulsation or not. And to detect this, this sign or to elicit this sign, it is very easy. You can just exert a little pressure on the tip of the nail like this until you create a reddish area in, in, in the base of the nail here and a pale area just at the distal part of the nail. And this reddish area in cases of severe aortic regurgitation will be pulsatile, i.e. moving forward and backward. If we find this, this means that this patient has hyperdynamic circulation uh, and really it is very common in cases of severe aortic regurgitation. Nevertheless, we have to examine the, 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 the moisture of the hand. If the hand is warm and sweaty, this might indicate thyrotoxicosis. But if the hand is dry and with normal temperature, this is normal. Uh, after that, uh, we have to uh, look at 
the the arm of the patient if there is any particular hemorrhage or is a process in the site of the needles or not which may indicate some bleeding diathesis and the particular hemorrhage as i mentioned it may be a sign of infective endocarditis due to vasculitis by this uh, we, we may have finished the hand. The only two points who are, who are remaining, which are remaining here in the hand examination is tremors. And we have two types of tremors. The fine tremors in cases of thyrotoxicosis and the drug used in some cardiac illnesses like in bronchial asthma. Bronchial asthma uh, drugs like theophyllin, like um, uh, mimetic drug, uh, uh, which is uh, beta 2 agonist will cause some fine tremors in some patients and in that case we have to stretch the hands of the patient anteriorly like this could you please stretch your hands and open your fingers and we observe if we are not able to get it uh, by just uh, simple vision we can put a piece of paper like this to see if there is fine tremors or not and again, as I mentioned, fine tremors may indicate thyrotoxicosis, which is very important in the cardiovascular system because it has some cardiovascular uh, complication, like uh, thyrotoxic heart disease and heart failure. Then, uh, we have to look at flabbing tremor, if the patient has flabbing tremors or not, and the flabbing tremors here may be due to COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, associated with right side heart failure, i.e. associated with core pulmonary heart failure. And in that case, we ask the patient to stretch his arms fully and to push, uh, to, to, to extend his rest joints as if he is pushing against the wall. He has to separate his finger, open your finger please, and we ask him, you know, stretch as if you are pushing against the wall. Then we wait and look at the hands of the patient if there is flabbing tremor coming spontaneously or not. If not coming spontaneously, then we may try to induce it by overstretching the rest of the patient in this way. And then we look. The, of course, this is negative, and if there is flapping tremors, it will be like the flapping of the bird wings, like this. Okay? And this might indicate some uh, chronic problem, like chronic COPD, complicated uh, sometimes with right-sided heart failure. Then, we move to the vital signs of the patient, and we'll start by the radial pulse. We detect the radial pulse when we put the patient arm vertical on the bed like this. Please come from this side. Yeah. We have to put the patient's arm vertical on the bed. And against the radius bone, we have to put our thumb and we, the, the three fingers, the four finger middle and, and ring finger, index finger middle and ring finger are here trying to find and to detect the radial artery by compressing it against the radius bone here. It is very easy to detect, and once you detect it, you have to make few comments on the radial pulse. Number one, the regularity or the rhythm. Is it regular or irregular? And if it is irregular, is it totally irregular or irregularly irregular like in cases of atrial fibrillation? or it, the, the, regular, the irregularity is due to some missed beats in cases of premature, uh, premature beats, premature ventricular contraction or premature atrial contraction. We call it regular irregularity. So if it is totally irregular, you can't count three or four regular beats, consecutive regular beats. But if it is totally irregular, you cannot count three or four consecutive regular beats. Then, after that, we have to count the rate of the radial pulse by uh, counting the number of impulses in 30 seconds to one minute. And please avoid counting only in, in 15 seconds, because if you have any error in 15 seconds, this error will be multiplied by 4, so the difference due to this error will be great difference. 
So it's better to take it in 30 seconds at least to one minute. And if it is, if, if it is taken in 30 seconds, you have to multiply by two. Uh, for example, this patient has about 35 beats in 30 seconds means he that, that he has 70 uh, impulses uh, or the radial pulse rate is about 70 per minute and it is totally regular pulse. Finishing from rate and rhythm, we have to evaluate the pulse volume. And as you know, the pulse volume is created by the difference between the systolic pulse pressure and the diastolic pulse pressure, which we detect it by sphygmoanometer, by measuring the blood pressure of the patient. So this is a qualitative assessment of the pulse volume done by the hand of the physician. So you have to know the normal volume by examining many normal individuals first to know what is normal. If the volume is higher than the normal which you saved in your brain, which you kept in your brain, then we call it high volume. If the volume is lower than normal, we call it low volume. After the volume, we have to evaluate the pulse character. And we have different types of pulse character. The first is a normal pulse character, which again we train ourselves by examining normal individual to know what is the normal character of the pulse. Then there is some abnormal characters like collapsing pulse, which is very important, occurs, collapsing pulse occurs in cases of severe aortic regurgitation. It occurs in cases of hyperdynamic circulation like thyrotoxicosis, like anemia. It occurs also during the pregnancy because of hyperdynamic circulation. It occurs during febrile illness and septicemia in uh, some patient with high cardiac output. It occurs in patient with severe arteriosclerosis in elderly age group. How can we evaluate for collapsing pulse? Collapsing pulse, you have to use your two hands in elaborating or in detecting collapsing pulse. You hold the hand of the patient with your left hand like this to support the arm of the patient up and down. And to keep your right hand free to be able to detect the character of the pulse. Then we palpate the brachial pulse which is medial here in the forearm of the patient. We palpate it at the level of the heart like this. We try to feel it and you see its quality. If the quality of the pulse is suddenly upstroking or sudden sliding up and suddenly disappearing or suddenly collapsing, so that will be the collapsing pulse. We can aggravate this phenomena by raising the arm up higher than the level of the heart. In that case, we are magnifying the collapsing element of a collapsing pulse, i.e the rapid or the fast down stroke of the pulse. We will feel that there is a strong percussion wave received by the palm of my hand. This strong percussion wave will disappear suddenly or it will collapse suddenly. And this will be magnified by raising the arm up higher than the heart of the patient. This is concerning the collapsing pulse. By the way, there is another name for this pulse uh, the other name is water hammer pulse. Then, after finishing from seeing or trying to evaluate the pulse, if it is collapsing or not, we have some other characters like slow rising pulse or pulses varvus etalbus. Slow rising occurs whenever the left ventricle is contracting against resistance, against Aortic stenosis, if there is aortic stenosis, the left ventricle will be contracting again its resistance so the ejection phase will be prolonged. If it is prolonged, the generation of the radial impulse and other arterial impulses will take longer time. So it will be slow rising or slow peaking, a slow peaking pulse. That slow peaking pulse will be uh, uh, detected easily or appreciated easily in the radial artery, on the brachial artery, on the carotid artery, on femoral artery, in every artery it will be uh, beaking very slowly. 
In slow rising pulse, there will be low pulse volume, low pulse volume, i.e. there will be also narrow pulse pressure when we measure the blood pressure of this patient, i.e. the difference between systolic pressure and diastolic pressure will be small difference because uh, of low systolic blood pressure due to aortic stenosis. Then, a, a, a third type of abnormal pulse, which is pulsus paradoxicus. And pulsus paradoxicus, we can feel it by palpation of the radial pulse and brachial pulse, and we can get it more meticulously and more accurately by measuring the blood pressure of the patient in a different way uh, to detect the pulsus paradoxicus. Uh, Balsus paradoxicus means what? Means that when we feel the radial pulse or the brachial pulse of the patient, we'll feel that the volume of the pulse is variable, is increasing during expiration and decreasing during inspiration. The volume will decrease during in, in, in inspiration and it will increase during expiration. Then back to another a character which may be related to the resin. That is what is called balsas bigeminus and balsas trigeminus. Balsas bigeminus means that you appreciate one impulse which is normal followed by another impulse which is weak. But this impulse which is weak is coming shortly after the normal impulse. Then that abnormal or weak impulse will be followed by a pause. Then a new one, new normal, then after the new normal, shortly after it, there will be a weak impulse. Then a compensatory pause, followed by normal impulse. Then a new weak impulse shortly after the normal one. So in every two impulses, there is one strong and one weak, and the weak is occurring shortly after the normal or the strong one, and the weak one is usually followed by a boss. We call this balsas by geminus. By geminus means in Arabic, al bals at tawami thunay. Then we move to uh, another uh, type of irregularity, which is balsas trigeminus. I.e., from every three beads or every three impulses, there is one normal and two abnormal or two normal and one abnormal two normal and one abnormal two normal and one abnormal we call this pulsus trigeminus or it may be one normal and two abnormal we call it pulsus trigeminus finishing from the pulse character all of this are around uh, or describing uh, what is normal character and abnormal character i repeat abnormal character may be collapsing may be slow rising, may be balsas paradoxicus, may be balsas bigeminus, may be balsas trigeminus. Then we have to find if the two radial impulses or radial pulses are synchronized or not by palpating the two radial arteries in the two sides or the two arms of the patients. In this way, this is the same way like radial pulse, but here, for my convenience as a physician, I have to feel the radial pulse here with the thumb, and my fingers is on the other side, just I am compressing gently the, the, the radial pulse with the thumb against the radius bone in this way. And I'm trying to correlate the temporal relation i.e. the time relation between the two radial pulses, if they are occurring at the same time spontaneously or not. If they are occurring at the same time, this means that they are synchronized. The synchronization is not only synchronization of timing, but also of pulse volume. We have to uh, compare the pulse volume into the, in, in the two sides to see if the pulse volume is equal or not in the two sides. Another point of synchronization, which is synchronization, this is what is called radio-radial synchronization. What I finished is radio-radial synchronization. There is 
Another form of synchronization, which is radiofemoral synchronization. Radiofemoral synchronization. And radiofemoral uh, pulsation, or the relation between radial artery pulsation and the femoral pulsation is done in this way. Could you please release your uh, belt? We palpate the femoral artery and the inguinal region here, just below the inguinal ligament. It's open, open, open your uh, trousers. Down, down, some down in this side, little down in this side. Some more down. Put it just a few seconds. We palpate the femoral artery here, uh, and usually we palpate it in the junction between the medial third of the inguinal ligament and the outer two thirds just below it in that part, in the junction between the outer third, uh, sorry, the outer two thirds and the medial third. And I can feel it very easily now. I feel it like this, and I continue feeling the radial pulse like this. And then I evaluate. If they are coming together, so they will be synchronized. If the femoral artery pulsation is delayed, so we call it radiofemoral delay. In what occasion uh, the radiofemoral delay occurs? Radiofemoral delay occurs in single occasion, which is the coarctation of the aorta. So if there is aortic coarctation, we can see or we can detect hypertension in younger age group. So in younger age group, uh, 18 year old guy or um, 17 year old guy or 20 year old and he is severely hypertensive, then we'll be obliged to find if there is radiofemoral delay or not as a clue, as, an, as a sign of aortic coarctation. So this is very important only in cases of early hypertension in younger age group. After synchronization, we have to try to feel the radial uh, artery uh, wall as well as brachial artery wall. Normally, we don't feel the wall of the uh, arteries. The wall of the arteries are unfelt. We only feel the pulsation. We only appreciate the pulsation. But if the walls are felt like a cord, then we have to think in generalized atherosclerosis in this patient. So we start by brachial artery. We evaluate also the, uh, by, uh, we, we start by radial artery. Then we evaluate the brachial and the carotid artery, femoral arteries for this visible walls, if we like, to evaluate uh, for uh, generalized atherosclerosis. Uh, after uh, uh, finishing the evaluation of the radial bulge, and talking about uh, the pulse uh, uh, volume, rhythm, uh, rate, character, visible walls, synchronization, all of this, we have to start evaluating the blood pressure of the patient. And evaluation of blood pressure should be in an objective manner using or utilizing the sphygmomanometer. What are the circumstances which we have to prepare for good measurement of blood pressure. Number one, the room should be warm for the patient. And the patient should be familiar with his physician. So we should not measure the blood pressure directly after the patient enters the room. You know, we have to ask him to sit down and to become calm. We have to take to him, taking some um, history from the patient, making the patient familiar with me as a physician, and after 10 minutes from this dialogue with me as a physician or with the nurse staff, after 5 to 10 minutes, they will be able to take the blood pressure in good way or to measure the blood pressure in good way. There is a second point about the sphygmomanometer itself. The cuff of the sphygmomanometer should be with a proper size for every patient. We have the average size like this for average person, which is 25 centimeter. The bladder of the calf, the bladder is here, is the uh, uh, elastic uh, uh, bladder inside the, this uh, clothing calf or this material. Inside this material, there is a elast an elastic bladder which we inflate. 
So the length of this bladder should be 25 centimeter and its breadth should be more than 12.5 centimeter for average arm. If we have an obese patient, we have to get a broader calf and longer, broader and longer. And this bladder should be circumscribed and we're able to circumscribe two thirds to three quarters of the circumference of the arm of the patient. Two thirds to three quarters. Nevertheless, we have to apply it firmly, not too tight and not too loose to the upper arm of the patient here. We have a mark here which indicates the middle point or the middle line of this bladder. This mark should be parallel to the brachial artery to get good blood pressure measurement. We prefer in cardiology to take the blood pressure from the left arm of the patient while sitting and while swine in, two, in the two positions. And that is why because uh, in some patients, in some medical illnesses, he may have hypovolemia or he may have autonomic dysfunction causing what is called emotional drop of the blood pressure. So all of this should be in, in the mind of the operator or of the physician or of the nurse staff before starting measuring the blood pressure. So if we apply this, we go to the left side of the patient and this side. We apply the cuff firmly, as I mentioned, not too tight and not too loose, just the firm application, one inch above the anticubital fossa, this way, one inch above the anticubital fossa, and this mark should be parallel to the brachial artery, and this is how we apply it, firm application. Then I hold this bulb to be able to inflate whenever I want and I keep my eyes on the mercurial column. And I start by what is called the palpable method of measuring the systolic blood pressure by palpating the radial buds like this or the brachial buds and it will be a chance to, to know where is the brachial artery pulsation for the stethoscopic method. If this is the brachial pulsation here, then I start inflating the cuff, which will spontaneously elevate the mercurial column until I feel the disappearance of the brachial pulsation. Then I deflate slowly, slowly, at a slow speed, not very slow, but reasonable deflation until I feel the brachial artery pulsation again. I felt it at 100. 100 means, roughly speaking, this patient has systolic blood pressure of 100 millimercury. And this will be very close to the figure which I am going to get by stethoscope. So it will make my life easy because I know from the beginning now by palpatory method that the systolic blood pressure is about 100. The accurate measurement will be by stethoscope and I expect that the systolic pressure may be a little higher than 100 because my tactile sensation is not accurate like the auditory sensation or the hearing sensation. So by hearing, I will get the accurate figure. And how, what is the mechanism? In a blood pressure measurement, we have five sounds. They are called Kurutkov sound. I will elevate the pressure in the machine and in the cuff, and I apply the stethoscope on the brachial artery like this. Then I inflate to increase the pressure and I listen to the brachial pulsation, brachial sounds until they disappear. And I elevate 20 to 30 millimercury above the level of disappearance. Then I start deflating. The first appearance of the brachial artery sounds 
we call it first Kolotkov sound. And it is here 102 exactly. Then the sound which started as murmurish, it, it is increasing in the second Kolotkov and the third Kolotkov to the maximum. Then it's becoming murmurish again. Then it is disappearing at the level of 70-72. So the disappearance of the brachial artery sounds, we call it fifth sucrut cough sound. So we have fifth sucrut cough with the appearance of the sound, and at which we detect the systolic blood pressure. Then that sound will increase in intensity and we call it second Kolotkov sound. Further increase and it becomes the maximum or the peak of the intensity at third Kolotkov. Then at fourth Kolotkov, it will come down again and it becomes murmurish. And at disappearance, we consider it as fifth Kolotkov sound and we consider it the diastolic blood pressure measurement. So we have two levels, first Kolotkov, correlates with systolic pressure and the fifth Kolotkov correlates with diastolic blood pressure. So the blood pressure of this patient was 102 by 72. And this is normal. What is the normal systolic pressure? Any pressure between uh, uh, 90 and 120 will be considered as normal. This is the absolute normal. If it is more than 120 systolic, so the patient, and this is reproducible, so the patient is a subject who may develop hypertension in the future. We call it uh, uh, subclinical hypertension state or pre-hypertensive state. What about diastolic pressure? The normal diastolic pressure is between 60 and 90 millimercury. Any patient with blood pressure between 80 and 89, it is pre-hypertensive. So the normal is really below 80. And between 80 and 89, we consider it to be a pre-hypertensive state. It's still normal, but high normal. So this is a new classification of blood pressure. Again, I repeat, the normal systolic is between 80 and 120, between 120 to 139 is considered to be a pre-hypertensive state if it is reproduced several times. And the diastolic, normal diastolic between 60 and 80, between 80 and 89 is considered to be a hypertensive state if it is reproduced on several occasions. So this is how to measure the blood pressure and how to correlate between your battery method and your auscultatory method of measuring the blood pressure. Sometimes, as I mentioned before, we have to measure the blood pressure in sitting up position and in spine position. Sometimes in standing up position and spine position to evaluate if there is postural drop or not. Like in cases of hypovolemia due to hemorrhage or due to dehydration and in cases of autonomic neuropathy like in long-standing diabetes mellitus and in idiopathic autonomic neuropathy and in elderly age group to avoid some drugs which may magnify the problem of postural hypotension. So we have to evaluate the blood pressure in two positions. Not only this, we should not be satisfied by measuring the blood pressure one time during the visit of the patient. We may repeat measuring it after another five minutes and we take the average of the two measurements or we take the second one because the rate of anxiety in the first measurement will be much higher than after some time. Uh, when you repeat a second measurement, most likely this will be more accurate and more realistic than the first one. For either you take the average of the two or uh, you, you take the second one. The third point, when we will be able to diagnose a hypertension in certain individual. Whenever the patient has blood pressure of 140 and above, over 90 and above, and this measurement is reproduced several times on several occasions, then more than three times with one week apart, might indicate that this patient is hypertensive. 
to be 100% sure of this, you have to subject your patient to what is called ambulatory blood pressure monitoring to monitor his blood pressure in ambulatory manner by a machine which will be taken by the patient to his home which will measure the blood pressure according to your request every half an hour or every one hour to uh, record it for you about 24 measurements in one day or 48 measurements and you look at it to see if most of the readings are hypertensive or not or indicating the hypertension if they are exceeding the threshold of systolic and diastolic blood pressure or not and not only this but to see also the diurnal variation of blood pressure measurement if a patient has well and good uh, diurnal variation this means that his autonomic nervous system is okay but if he is losing this diurnal variation this uh, bears bad prognostic sign so this uh, what I can say about the blood pressure measurement in this short time now we can remove the cuff and we continue with other parts of a cardiovascular examination then after we finished from how to measure the blood pressure of the patient, we move to another vital sign which is respiratory rate. Respiratory rate, I am sure that it was taught to you by uh, Dr. Ibrahim Saeed, but I just, I will repeat uh, uh, a brief account on how to do it for uh, the people who didn't attend that uh, presentation. Number one, patient might be very anxious while I am examining him, so I have to avoid uh, adding to his anxiety by start counting his rate in a very rude manner. I, I, I have to distract his attention by doing some other test to keep him not very anxious. Uh, for example, we can continue palpating his radial butts to distract his attention. Uh, and after that, I look at the chest of the patient and start counting the respiratory rate. Again, I have to count it in one minute or at least 30 seconds. If I am, in, um, if I am counting in 30 seconds, then I have to multiply by two. If it is in one minute, it will be the rate per minute. And as you know, the normal respiratory rate per minute is between 12 and 20, uh, averagely between 14 and 18. But uh, it, is, it will be normal up to 12, and it will be normal up to 20 as upper limit of normal. Higher than 20 will be tachypnea, and less than uh, 12 uh, will be some uh, uh, sort of decreased respiratory rate. So it's very important to know the normal respiratory rate to see if your patient is uh, with a normal respiratory rate or not. Then we move to the fourth vital sign, which is the temperature. And by temperature, we mean core temperature. Core temperature means the internal temperature of the patient. And to get this, you have to use your thermometer uh, from under the tongue of the uh, patient. And you ask the patient to burst his lips just to keep the thermometer in good position and to get the real temperature. If the patient is uh, in, uh, or has endotracheal tube or he is mouse breather or he cannot hold the, 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 the thermometer like in comatose patient or pediatric age group, then we can take it from the axilla, we put the thermometer here and we make the patient arm tight like this. If we are taking an axillary temperature, then this is external temperature, and we have in that case to add 0.5 degrees centigrade to get the real or the equivalence of core temperature. Suppose we are dealing with uh, a, 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 a pediatric age group, then rectal temperature might be useful because of the movement of the child. We can take rect rectal temperature and we subtract Instead of adding, we subtract 0 0.5 degrees centigrade to get his real core temperature or equivalence to uh, core temperature. By this, we have finished the vital signs and we move to the face of the patient. And before we start any specific examination of the face, we have to make some comments. If this face is normal for his race or not, 
Uh, if, if it is normal, that is good. If there is some abnormal faces like cushionoid face, moon face, in case of steroid therapy or cushion disease, if the face of the patient is babythoric face, if the, if the patient has some malar rash in the butterfly area which may indicate uh, some mitral valve disease or it may indicate connective tissue disease, so all of this description should be elaborated on if they are present. Nevertheless, we have to see if there is abnormal faces like marfanoid face, elongated narrow face, or a Down syndrome face in which the nasal bridge is depressed and wide and the eye are transverse and there is a lower set of the ears. Down's face is very important to uh, elaborate on because in Down's and Marfan they may be associated with some cardiovascular abnormalities. For example, in Marfan syndrome patient may have aortic regurgitation, may have uh, atrial septal effect may have uh, uh, mitral valve prolapse, and in Down syndrome, patient may have uh, 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 common AV canal or VSD. So it's very important to find if he, the patient has abnormal faces or not. Not only this, but you can see the features of the patient if he is acromegalic or not, the face will tell you if this patient is, has acromegalic features or not. And acromegalic feature again might be associated with diabetes mellitus and a lot of uh, cardiovascular outcomes of diabetes mellitus. Not only this, but we have to look at the face of the patient to see if there is some periorbital edema like in chronic renal failure, like in generalized anasarca due to severe heart failure. So it is very important to look if there is very orbital edema in this, in the soft tissue area below the eyes and around the eyelids or not. Not only this, but we have to look at the eye globes. If they are protruding, i.e. if the patient, uh, i.e. patient has exosalmos or not. If he has exosalmos, if he has leg lag, uh, leg, lag, leg lag and leg, leg retraction, this might indicate that the patient has Graves disease. And as we know, Graves disease, uh, uh, one of its main manifestation and main complication is cyrotoxic heart disease. So it is very important to comment on all of this if they are there or not. Then, after finishing from the description of the face of the patient, then we move to the eyes specifically. And in the eye, as I mentioned before, eyes uh, are like the hands. They give you a lot of idea about some diseases uh, uh, in, in the body. For example, we have to see if the patient has valor or not, and we can elaborate on valor by stretching the lower eyelids like this to see the conjunctiva. Could you please look upward? Now I can see the conjunctiva of the patient and I have to compare it with the color of my nail bed. If it is matching with the color of my nail bed, i.e. the same color, this means that the patient has no bulb. And after, the, if, if they are pale as compared to my nail bed, then we say that the patient is pale. Then we move to the upper rim of the sclera and to raise the two upper eyelids in this way, we ask the patient to look down. Could you please look down? Look to my finger without moving your head. So I can see most of the upper rims. Could you please look down? Keep looking to my finger without moving your head. Okay. Now I can see the uh, upper rim of the sclera clearly and I can elaborate if there is jaundice or not, which will be a yellowish discoloration of that whitish uh, organ uh, uh, the sclera or whitish tissue uh, of the sclera. After this I ask the patient to open his eyes and to look to the uh, um, um, the, the, the ceiling up, up, upward, look upward to see if there is arcus cornealis or arcus senilis. Arcus cornealis we keep it for younger age group, younger than 50 years or younger than 60 years, and we keep arcus senilis for elderly age group when they are above 60 years. And by arcus, 
ومين ليفل ديبوزيشن جريش اور بيت يلو ويش ليفل ديبوزيشن اراوند ذا كورنيا اوف ذا بيشنت سو هير ات از نيجاتيف فور اركاس بات ان ميني بيشنت تو ذس ليفيديميا يو ماي ابريشيت ذس اركاس ان يونكر ايج جروب يو ماي ابريشيت ات ان 40 يير ان 50 ييرز 55 ييرز But if it occurs in ages of 70 or 75, this will be natural in many cases and not essentially due to hyperlipidemia. Another sign of hyperlipidemia we can detect it in the eyelids of the patient when we find some lipid streaks, lipid deposition, grayish or yellowish, in the upper eyelid or lower eyelid, uh, in the epicanthal area. In both sides, in both eye, uh, upper, both upper eyelids or lower eyelids, in both sides. This will, both of them with the arcus, will be signs of hyperlipidemia, high LDL cholesterol, high total cholesterol, hypertriglyceridemia, uh, or combination of this. Then, before we leave the eyes, if we know from our blood pressure, blood pressure measurement. And from the history of the patient that he is hypertensive, fundus examination will be a must. We have to examine the fundus of the patient to see if there is any retinal changes due to hypertension or not, or hypertensive retinopathy changes. Uh, like what? Like silver wiring, AV nipping, the arteries will be compressing the veins, giving you the phenomena of AV nipping. If there is babyledema or not, and if there is retinal hemorrhage or not. Another case in which you have to examine the fundi of the patient is a chronic diabetes mellitus to see if there is any form of diabetic retinopathy and if there is vitreous hemorrhage or not. All of this should be done for the diabetic and hypertensive patient when we examine the eye of the patient. From the eyes we move down to the uh, mouth of the patient and uh, we have to start asking, asking the patient to open his mouth and to use the tongue depressor and put light through a torch or bedside lamp. Could you please open your mouth? We start by oral and dental hygiene. For example, this patient has uh, some dental caries. It's not only the oral hygiene and the the, the, the smell of the mouth of the patient, but also we have to comment if there is dental cares or not, and the relation between this and the cardiovascular problem is known. If a patient has a lot of dental cares, the propensity of this patient to infective endocarditis if he has underlying cardiac lesion will be high. So dental cares, oral hygiene are very important. Then we look at the heart palate to see if this patient is high arched palate or not, or has high arched palate or not. High arched palate or cleft palate may indicate Marfan syndrome, presence of Marfan syndrome. Then we ask the patient to raise his tongue in the, uh, uh, inside his mouth, raise your tongue up, and we look at the sublingual mucosa for a few things. The most important one is central cyanosis. This is warm mucosa. Any cyanosis there will be central due to cyanotic congenital heart disease or due to respiratory failure, like in cases of COPD or very severe uh, bronchial asthma, very severe one. Cyanosis in the sublingual mucosa. Also, valor can be detected in the sublingual mucosa. Open your mouth, raise your tongue up and jaundice can be detected in the sublingual mucosa. What else? The bowel, if the patient has bowel, we can detect it, we can elicit it by rolling the, lip, the lower lip of the patient. Could you please relax, relax, relax your mouth, or close your mouth. We can pull out the lip of the patient in this way to look at its root. If the patient is pale, it will show you valor in the root of the, the lip of the patient. The root of the lip will be very pale. And in that case, you can decide easily that this patient is uh, pale or not. And by the way, this is much better area to detect valor than the nails, the nail bed, the palms, and the conjunctiva. Another area in the mouth which is very important for bowel is the hard palate. Could you please open your mouth? 
keep your tongue uh, keep your tongue in its place look at the hard palate to see if the hard palate is bare or not it's very important also to comment on the hard palate for two things for high arch palate and for cleft palate and for uh, power then after finishing from oral hygiene, dental curves, high arched palate, cyanosis, balor, jaundice, we have to examine the throat of the patient if he has follicular tonsillitis or not, if he has pharyngitis or not, and this, as I mentioned, needs tongue depressor and good light. By this, we almost finish the mouth of the patient and we move to the neck. And in the neck, we have three main structures related to cardiovascular system examination. The three structures are the jugular veins and jugular venous pressure, carotid arteries, and thyroid gland. We have to examine the three parts or the three elements in the neck. Jugular venous pressure, carotid arteries or carotid artery pulsation, and thyroid gland. To start the examine, examining the jugular venous pressure, we have to raise the head of the, the, of the bed to the inclination of 45 degree. I wonder if we can invent this one or not. Suppose this is, we cannot, definitely we cannot, this is maximum inclination, but we have to start by 45 degrees. And at 45 degrees, we have to have very good uh, light like this light if it is not available then we have to have a bedside lamp in my opinion bedside lamp or good light like this is much better than the torch light torch light if it is moving it might create a lot of waves which might uh, give you hard time in evaluating the pulsation so it's better to be a bedside lamp or good light like this and i i look at the area between the two heads of sternocleidomastoid muscle to see if there is pulsation there or not. If there is pulsation there, then I look at the lateral border of sternocleidomastoid muscle. If there is pulsation there, then it might be pulsation due to high pressure in the right internal uh, internal jugular vein. If the pulse or, the pulse, or if the venous pulsation are very high, it will appear medial to sternocleidomastoid muscle in its upper segment. So if it is mildly elevated, it will appear only between the two heads of sternocleidomastoid muscle, i.e. here. If it is higher than this, it will appear lateral. If it is more and more higher, it will appear medial to sternocleidomastoid muscle. And this is a real anatomic course of internal jugular vein, it comes from jugular foramina here, running medial to sternocleidomastoid muscle, then a bit lateral behind its lateral border, then it will uh, it will join the external jugular vein between the two heads of sternocleidomastoid muscle here. So if it starts rising, it will appear first between the two heads, then it will go lateral, then it will go medial, and it is very important to remember that 45 degrees is the most important position. But if the, the venous congestion is very severe one, then you increase the inclination to be near sitting up or even sitting up position to decrease the amount of, amount of congestion and to be able to appreciate better uh, venous waves, venous pressure waves in a sitting position. will be able to evaluate. Then, if there is mild elevation, you may decrease the inclination like this situation about 20 or 30 degree, the venous pulsation will appear better than in 45. So we have three situations. The ideal situation is 45. If it is well and good, we measure at 45. And I will tell you how to measure it. If there is mild elevation and I can see it, with some difficulty, then I have to lower the inclination to 30 or 20 degrees. If there is too much congestion, this, uh, uh, then we have to increase the inclination 
uh, to be near sitting position or sit in sitting position to decrease the congestion and to appreciate better the waves. Let us consider that the patient is reclined in 45 degrees. How can we measure the uh, jugular venous pressure waves? It is very easy. We have to have a roller and to consider this ball bend as a roller. And we will bend the sternal angle and then we put the roller vertical to the sternal angle and vertical to the ground, perpendicular to it. And we try to find where is the upper level of the venous pulsation. From the upper level, we create a horizontal plane, horizontal to the ground, like this, to meet that vertical line which is created by our roller. Then we measure this height. This will be the height of the venous pressure above the sternal angle. Why sternal angle? The sternal angle represents for us the reference point because just below it, the right atrium is lying. And we know that the right atrial pressure averagely is about five uh, centimeter water so we have to add five centimeter water to this four centimeter. So the venous pressure or the jugular venous pressure in this patient will be nine. The upper limit of normal, the upper limit of normal jugular venous pressure is eight centimeter water. If it is higher than eight, we, we consider it increased jugular venous pressure or elevated or raised jugular venous pressure. And this will indicate pulmonary hypertension tricuspid regurgitation, tricuspid stenosis, uh, or right-sided heart failure. So, increased jugular venous pressure is very important to evaluate if there is element or if there is evidence of right-sided heart failure or not. So we have to remember that. Suppose we have set the patient up because of severely congested neck veins. Could you please set up? Suppose he is setting up and the, could you please give me the marker? And I detected jugular venous pressure all through up to here. Then I take a direct measurement from that level to the sternal angle, which is here. The sternal angle is here. So this is about 17 centimeter plus 5. And the jugular venous pressure in that case will remove it. The jugular venous pressure in that case will be about 20. Sorry for that. We'll remove it with alcohol. Uh, the jugular venous pressure will be a 22 centimeter, which is highly elevated. And I needed to set the patient up to uh, decrease the congestion and to be able to see good venous waves. And as I mentioned before, if the patient has mild elevation, we have to decrease the inclination to be less than 45, to be 30 or less than 30. Just before we leave the discussion about uh, jugular venous pressure, we have to mention what are the jugular venous pressure waves. We know that the jugular venous pressure waves are multiple waves and they are not simple waves. There is two uh, positive pressure waves and two major negative pressure waves. The two positive pressure waves are A wave and V wave. And A stands for the wave which is resulting from atrial contraction. By atrial contraction, right atrial contraction, this will increase the pressure in the right atrium and it will give us a positive wave in the jugular uh, veins. And then the second positive wave is V wave and V most likely is standing for venous return. So whenever the venous return is accumulating in the right atrium from superior and inferior vena cava, then the pressure in the right atrium will increase again and it will give a positive wave in the neck veins, i.e. in the jugular venous pressure. What about the negative wave? We have two negative waves. The first negative wave is the X wave, which comes after the atrial contraction, i.e. after the A wave. 
and it, it is due to the reduction of pressure in the right atrium due to right atrial relaxation. The second negative wave is the Y wave, which comes after the V wave, and it is due to sudden opening of the tricuspid valve and the sudden flow of blood from right atrium to right ventricle, and this will be associated with reduction, severe reduction of the pressure in the right atrium, giving us the Y wave. So an X wave, which is negative, is coming after the contraction of the, uh, of the right atrium and left atrium after the A wave, and the second negative wave is the Y descent, which is coming after the uh, V wave. So this is the type of waves, and there is many abnormalities of this. If the patient develops atrial fibrillation, we have to know that the A wave, with the, which is the result of atrial contraction, will disappear. So A wave will disappear in cases of atrial fibrillation. In cases of pulmonary hypertension, the B, the, the, the pulmonary artery pressure will increase the pressure in the right ventricle, then in right atrium, then in the jugular veins, and it will give us prominent A wave. If there is tricuspid stenosis, it will be associated with very prominent uh, A wave or giant A wave. In cases of atrioventricular dissociation, i.e., there is no synchrony and, uh, of the conduction system and the conduction system is abrupted at the atrioventricular level. So the ventricle will contract not after the atrial contraction, but maybe with ventricular con with atrial contraction, both the ventricle and atrium will contract together, and this will result in occurrence of what is called the canon A wave, i.e. like the canon uh, shot. It will be very high, uh, and, and it will be occasional and not continuous. So canon A wave is occasional, occurs in cases of ventricular tachycardia and in cases of third degree A block and in all cases of atrioventricular dissociation. So remember canon A wave, remember giant A wave like in tricuspid stenosis because of severe elevation of right atrial pressure. Remember a uh, large A or prominent A wave in cases of pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary stenosis. Once atrial fibrillation develops, the A wave will disappear and the, 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 the only remaining positive wave will be V wave. And this occurs very frequently in chronic heart failure patients and in all cases of cardiomyopathies, mitral valve disease, the rate and the frequency of atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, hypertension, the frequency of atrial fibrillation will be very high in such medical condition or cardiovascular condition and also in thyrotoxic heart disease. We have to remember very well the atrial fibrillation and its impact on jugular venous pressure. After we finished from the, from the jugular venous pressure, we have to start looking into the second part in the neck, which is related to the cardiovascular examination. And this part is the carotid artery. So in the neck, we have to examine the two types of vessels, the jugular venous pressure and the carotid arteries. And before we put our hand to evaluate the carotid artery, we have to know the surface anatomy of the carotid arteries. Carotid arteries, uh, or the common carotid artery, uh, 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 lies medial to sternocleidomastoid muscle, which will give the external and internal carotid artery. And medial to the sternocleidomastoid and just below the angle of the mouth, the carotid fossa is there, in which the bifurcation is there. And when we try to look for carotid artery examination, we have to concentrate on this area in the carotid fossa, which is again medial to sternocleidomastoid muscle and just below the angle of the mouth. So this is the area of uh, carotid artery pulsation, i.e. the carotid fossa. Excuse me, I will make a mark and I will remove it later on. This is the area in which I examine the carotid artery uh, or in which I examine the carotid artery and I, I palpate the carotid artery. So, and before I start, we have 
before I start palpating the carotid artery, we have to look by inspection. If I can see any carotid artery pulsation or not, any suprasternal notch pulsation or not, because all of these are related. So if there is suprasternal notch pulsation and there is vigorous carotid artery pulsation, this means that this patient has high blood dynamic circulation or severe atherosclerosis or uh, you know aortic regurgitation again which will be associated with hyperkinetic circulation with high stroke volume which will you give you vigorous pulsation in the suprasternal notch and medial to sternocleidomastoid muscle so by inspection we we'll look if there is vigorous or seeable or visible arterial pulsation or not and we should not miss to differentiate between arterial pulsation and pulsation coming from jugular venous uh, waves. Jugular venous pressure waves are multiple waves, are easy to see, but not easy to feel, and usually they are lateral to sternocleidomastoid muscle, whereas the arterial pulsation or carotid arterial pulsation is medial, and it is one thrust, it is not multiple, it is single thrust or th th single impulse, but the other one, the venous, are multiple impulses. The carotid artery pulsation is felt more than seen in normal individual, and it may be seen and felt in cases of high biokinetic circulation. So we have to differentiate between the two issues, the jugular venous waves and the carotid artery pulsation. Then, after we understand where is the, the carotid fossa, we can examine, we can palpate the carotid artery very easily. And please use your thumbs, the left thumb for the right carotid artery and the right thumb for left carotid artery. I know where is the angle of the mouse. No, no, you just keep your face like this. Thank you very much. So this is the angle of the mouse. This is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. I push mm, the top of my thumb just below the angle and medial to sternocleidomastoid muscle. In one or two seconds, I will get the carotid artery pulsation very easily. Once I feel it, I describe it. If it is with normal volume, or very high volume, if it is with normal character or not, and if there is palpable thrill or not. Please be relaxed. It is not a fight between you and the neck of the patient. And don't massage, and don't examine the two arteries together, right and left, because if you examine both together in elderly age group, uh, and in patient with carotid hypersensitivity, patient may get syncope may get fainting attack due to stimulation of baroreceptors in the carotid uh, sinus, which will stimulate the medulla, the cardio inhibitory center in medulla, uh, which will inhibit the heart, it will cause bradycardia and hypotension, and it will uh, you know, cause fainting for the patient due to the hypotension and due to the bradycardia. So avoid massaging the carotid artery. Just palpate gently and one side by one side. Please avoid examining the two sides together. And whenever you are dealing with elderly individual, then you have to be very gentle in examination of the carotid artery. The, the, this is how to examine the right carotid artery for the patient with your left thumb below the ankle and the medial to sternocleidomastoid muscle. What about the left one? Same with your thumb. At, at ease, you can push the tip of your thumb. Medial to sternocleidomastoid muscle and just below the angle of the mouse, you will be able to examine or to palpate the carotid artery effectively, the left carotid artery of the patient. So the right thumb for left carotid and the left thumb, your left thumb for the right carotid. And you have to comment on the pulse volume on the pulse character and if there is any thrill or not. Before you leave the carotid artery pulsation, you have to auscultate both of them for carotid artery per week and for radiation of a murmur which may be coming from aortic valve disease, like in aortic stenosis. And this is a way to examine or to auscultate the carotid artery pulsation. 
usually uh, the, the carotid artery bruit is high frequency sounds and it is best heard by the diaphragm of the stethoscope in good neck like this. You put your stethoscope on the carotid artery, ask the patient to hold the breath for a few moments. Could you please hold the breath? Hold, hold. Thank you very much. And you'll be able to appreciate if there is any systolic bruit or not. Bruit means soft murmur appreciated from the carotid artery. If the patient has, for example, aortic stenosis, uh, the murmur of aortic stenosis may radiate to the carotid artery and you will appreciate it with the diaphragm. Suppose you have very lean person and he has very lean or slim neck and the carotid fossa is very depressed, the carotid fossa, very prominent fossa. In that case, you may use your bell or the bell of your stethoscope and just to stretch the skin, push, push it while you are stretching the skin to appreciate better and to avoid overbridging, overbridging of the carotid artery if the carotid fossa is deep. So you can use the bell with some stretching of the skin, you are creating a diaphragm from the skin of the patient. Now we finished the carotid artery examination and the remaining part in the neck will be the thyroid gland. And why thyroid gland? Why I'm insisting to uh, examine the thyroid gland and to emphasize the importance of the thyroid gland. I mentioned already that we have to look at the eyes to see any manifestation of Graves' disease like ectophthalmos, lid lag, and lid retraction. And at the same time, we have to look at the thyroid gland to find if there is thyromegaly or not. If there is thyromegaly, then we have to examine by inspection, palpation, and auscultation, and uh, sorry, percussion and auscultation. So thyroid gland examination, as you know from your practice in medicine, has to be inspected, has to be palpated, has to be percussed, and it has to be auscultated. And uh, whenever you don't find the thyromegaly in, and the cardiovascular system is your target, no need to do all of this effort unless the thyroid gland is enlarged. Let us look here if there is thyromegaly or not. We have to set the patient up. Could you please swallow? Swallow. Okay. I can't see any thyroid mass, no thyromegaly, and from my point of view and cardiovascular system examination, no need to go further with palpation, percussion, and uh, auscultation of the thyroid gland in such a patient.